1398. 300 Majapahit warships surround the Kingdom of Singapore. They've come to settle unfinished business. Singapore is the last holdout of their old rival, Srivijaya. This is where the Srivijayan elites ran to when the Javanese took their Sumatran ports a century before. This far-flung province, this so-called Lion City, had escaped a siege by Hayam Wuruk decades before. But that would not happen again. Majapahit would destroy it. But in doing so, they would help birth their greatest rival, the Sultanate of Malacca. A quick aside before we begin. We started episode one of this series with a call to aid earthquake victims in Lombok. However, as we finished this episode, an even more devastating earthquake and tsunami struck the island of Sulawesi. Once again, we've linked two fundraising efforts in the description, one international aid organization and another for a local effort. Any help you could give would be deeply appreciated. And now back to the show. When Maja Pahet raised Singapore in 1389, they appeared to be at the height of their power. True, Hayam Uruk was nine years dead, and multiple princes were warring for the throne, but Majapahit navies still controlled the spice trade, challenging rival Thai fleets and the occasional Chinese trade expedition. Little did they know, however, that the archipelago was entering a period of transition and realignment. But it was not a great sweeping event that would bring change. It was a small gradual one for the kingdoms on Sumatra were increasingly converting to a new faith. It's unclear when Islam came to Indonesia, but it likely resembled the earlier diffusion of Hinduism and Buddhism through maritime networks. But even in this, it had an advantage. As a religion started by merchants, Islam was naturally portable. While Buddhism and Hinduism relied on geographically fixed elements like temples, god images, and monasteries, spreading Islam to new lands required only transporting books and cultural practices. Muslim traders had passed through Indonesia since the 8th century, but it was the 13th century before the religion gained local converts. The Malay traders of Sumatra seemed to have picked it up first. They specialized in the leg of the spice trade between the Strait of Malacca and the Bay of Bengal putting them in contact with Indianized Islam that was more compatible with their worldview than the versions practiced in the Middle East. Meanwhile, another wave came via China, where Muslims were enjoying an unusual period of lenience under the Mongol Yuan dynasty. Initial conversions were likely pragmatic. After all, common religion often greased the wheels of trade, and this new faith had intriguing things to offer, like Arabic writing, language, legal codes, and paper, which was so much more convenient than dried palm leaves. And it was these same tools of linguistic power, as well as the sweetener of greater diplomatic and trade links to Muslim kingdoms in India, that convinced local rulers to start adopting the teachings of the Prophet. In fact, this linguistic merger was so comprehensive that 15% of the words in Malay come from Arabic roots. By 1346, a flourishing Muslim trade city, the first in Indonesia, existed at the northern tip of Sumatra. And we know this from, who else, but Ibn Battuta. Yup, the same Ibn Battuta from our Mali series. Seriously, this guy went, like, everywhere. Anyway, Ibn Battuta describes a city in transition, one with mosques and Friday prayers, but where Islam is largely a religion of merchants and elites the easternmost city ruled by Muslims. But within a few decades, it wasn't alone. Islamic port cities were popping up all over Sumatra, but the greatest Muslim city was founded by Majapahit, by accident. Which brings us back to where we started, Singapore. Despite being only a shadow of Srivijaya's original power, the far-flung post of Singapore was crazy rich and kept the heirs of Srivijaya in the political game. But enemies surrounded it. The aggressive Thai kingdom of Ayutthaya looming in the north, and the expansionist Majapahit in the south. Not to mention, previous invasions had weakened the Lion City. So when Majapahit breached the walls, the Raja of Singapore, a man named Paramiswara, fled to the south and started anew. This time, he would do it right. He picked a strategic location right on the Strait of Malacca, 
where he could control traffic running to and from India. He used the old tactics of his three giant ancestors allying with the pirates and sea nomads to create a navy that would direct ships to his court, where he could charge protection. He also converted to Islam to ease the relations with India and took a Muslim name. And he named this new city-state the Sultanate of Malacca. But not after the strait. Oh no, the other way around. We call it the Strait of Malacca because of this city. Malacca would be a new zenith for a Muslim kingdom in Southeast Asia, and a powerful state that cast its sphere of influence to the surrounding maritime ports. But to attain that height, Paramiswara needed one last step to secure Malacca, a tributary ally to keep the larger powers off its back. He turned to China. The Mongol Yuan emperors were gone, overthrown by the Ming, and a century after Kublai Khan's failed invasion of Java, the imperial court was looking to re-engage in maritime Southeast Asia. Yet imperial inattention had allowed fleets from Majapahit and the Thai kingdoms to essentially run the table in the southern seas. The Sultanate of Malacca offered a unique opportunity for the Ming. They were looking for a partner to keep the sea lanes clear on the strait, one that wasn't a burgeoning empire set to challenge Chinese influence in the region. Malacca was, essentially, a knowing pawn. The Chinese got a check on Majapahit and Thai power, and Malacca received a security guarantee from its imperial ally. And that security guarantee wasn't an empty promise, because two years later, a Chinese fleet arrived in Malacca, a fleet larger than any seen before. It constituted over 300 ships. The largest were 600 feet long, with 12 sails and a crew of 500 sailors. 27,000 soldiers, diplomats, and other officials lived aboard, dwarfing the population of the coastal cities where they stopped. This was the first voyage of Zheng He and his famous treasure fleet, a series of seven missions stretching the whole of maritime Asia, from the South China Sea to the Bay of Bengal. Their task was neither one of exploration nor military force. Instead, they were a display of Chinese supremacy. Zheng He would come as a diplomat, dispensing gifts of silk, gold brocade, and other exotic goods. Yet the enormous fleet, sitting right off the coast, carried its own message. This great treasure fleet offered rewards with one hand and threatened retribution with the other. Align with China or face our wrath. Zheng He would make seven voyages between 1405 and 1433 dramatically reshaping politics in the southern seas. Malacca prospered as a Chinese ally, solidifying its claims and influences under imperial protection, receiving no less than six visits from the admiral. And Zheng He, himself a member of China's Muslim minority, helped spread and foster the growth of Islamic kingdoms in the region. And as all this happened, Majapahit increasingly turned inward, tearing itself apart over royal succession and court intrigues and ignoring the larger world. Over the next century, its vassals eroded like a beach during typhoon season. Majapahit still controlled the eastern Spice Islands, but the all-important strait now belonged to Malacca. Majapahit vassals in Sumatra, increasingly converting to Islam and sensing a shift in the political winds, began switching their allegiances to China or allying with other Muslim kingdoms. And in 1513, the falling dominoes finally reached Java itself. A coalition of Muslim kingdoms captured Majapahit's coastal ports and drove the court inland to their rice terraces. Splinters of the kingdom would survive until 1527, but Majapahit's time as the dominant power on Java was over. Their successor, the Muslim kingdom of Damak, went about wiping Majapahit from the island, burning their leaf scroll chronicles and epic poems relegating their old temples to neglected ruins. But Majapahit was not destroyed, at least not totally. Members of the royal family fled to Bali, taking their culture with them. They continued their Hindu-Buddhist faith. Scribes preserved the few royal documents they smuggled out, the historical records we have today, and artists kept Majapahit artistic styles alive. Ironically, the island that Majapahit violently dominated had become the last vestige of their way of life. 
To this day, Bali remains the last majority Hindu Buddhist island of Indonesia. But Majapahit survived in another sense as well. Unlike Srivijaya, which vanished from popular memory after it fell, Indonesians remembered Majapahit through the folklore, mythic history, and plays it inspired. That cultural memory of a powerful state uniting the islands lasted through centuries of Dutch colonialism. During the Indonesian independence movement of the 20th century, Majapahit became a rallying point for nationalists, a historical example of the archipelago united under one government, an argument that it was historically one nation rather than a constellation of kingdoms. And when the Republic of Indonesia won independence from the Dutch in 1949, Majapahit loomed large in the political imagination. The country's motto, Unity in Diversity, comes from a poem written during Hayam Uruk's reign. Gajah Mada University became its first place of higher education. To this day, there is real pride in the Majapahit period. But for those outside Java, this nostalgia can have a darker connotation. For them, Majapahit's vision of unity felt more like colonialism and is reflective of a political system that's, to this day, dominated by interests on Java. But what lesson should we, as students of history, take from Majapahit? We can enjoy its stories and understand its role in modern Indonesia, certainly. But to Rob and myself, the biggest takeaway is their use of water. We've all been trained to look at maps and only see the land. The water is an empty space, separating countries. But Majapahit didn't see it that way. To them, the ocean was the great connector, not only a way to trade and project naval power, but a sort of fluid conductor that carried the electrical charge of human culture from island to island. The sea united people and merged their ways of life, creating something new, an empire of water. <laughs>